I'm Joe Devine and welcome to Whiteboard Football Extra. Today, I'm joined by Alex Stewart to discuss the evolution of international tactics between 1982 and 1990, and I also spoke to Stephen Tudor about Denmark's victorious European Championships in 1992. The first thing, Alex, that we notice about the World Cups from the 1960s onwards is the decline in goals per game. Um, In our videos, we're attributing that to evolving tactics with a number of reasons cited for that. But if you had to summarise that, and you will have to because I'm going to ask you to, uh, if you had to summarise that dip, what would you say were the the primary reasons for for this decline over time? I think... International football is always an awkward one because teams are brought together for short periods of time quite intensively. Um, the qualification process is very, very strung out. So you've got, you know, weeks here and there. That privileges systems of football that are easy to implement and tend to focus on the defensive because it's a lot more straightforward to get a team to defend solidly than it is to get a team to attack with precision. So as football became more systematized and people started thinking about coaching tactics rather than... I mean, you've got to remember that early football, and and by that I'm talking even in really to the 1940s and 50s, a lot of coaching focused on physical conditioning, uh, occasional ball skills like dribbling and heading, but... It wasn't really until the 50s and 60s that people started coaching actual systems, coaching tactics, telling players where they needed to stand, who they needed to pass to, run to, and all of that kind of stuff. It was very much reliant on players' individual abilities and a sense of where their position was. Obviously, man-marking assisted that defensively because you know you just stood next to the guy that you were taking care of. So I think what happened is that, that systems were more coached that football coaching evolved into looking at at tactics as something worth dealing with rather than just conditioning and skills but that the very nature of international football and and this is a criticism that's leveled at international football even now meant that defensive coaching took primacy because it was easier to get teams to defend holistically than it was to get them to attack holistically when you put those things together then what you get is a decline in goals because teams are well drilled at the back. They're playing counter-attacking football. They're quite happy to sort of sit back and and defend. Uh, some teams, particularly say like Italy, made almost a, a you know a, a badge of honour of of how tough and and solid they were rather than being attacking. Uh, so it's kind of natural that this would occur, really. Um, and and in the period that we're looking up to, it sort of leading towards that transition to three at the back um, with a spare man where when you're playing against one or two strikers up top, it does make it much, much easier to negate and, and to stop goal scoring. And we've talked about this before, um, but there there is sometimes a, a generalised attitude towards football with fewer goals, um, you know, with people often thinking it's less attractive or maybe less interesting. From your perspective, that's clearly subjective, right? I mean, sh- surely there, there's a... A different, just a different sort of entertainment to be found in more defensive football. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, I mean, you know, obviously there's the the Gianni Brera quote about the perfect game of football would end nil nil, and I think in that respect, what he's talking about is the even matching up of teams. Um, and there's something inherently satisfying, I think, about watching a, a tactical duel at that level. Um, I think what's difficult is that we're almost talking here about kind of the purpose of football you know there there are there are two reasons that football as a sport exists one is for the teams that are playing it to win games or win tournaments or win leagues and the other is as a form of entertainment paying crowds uh, either physically or via the television watch something to be entertaining and and the majority of people will be watching for a result not you know sort of stagnant nil nil draw and they'll want those moments of skill those moments of excitement and and they are easier to consider in an attacking sense I mean you might have a brilliant sliding tackle or a phenomenal save 
But generally speaking, what we remember about football, and I, I'm saying we kind of generically, are goals. They're, they're, you know, sublime overhead kicks or they're rifled free kicks or they're the passes that unlock solid defences. Or moments of violence. Or moments of violence. Yes, absolutely. I think maybe we should be, you know, encouraging more of that. I think, yeah, yeah. Holland in 2010 is possibly the, the benchmark for that, Nigel de Young. But no, I mean, I personally, for me, as somebody who who watches football and writes about it from a tactical perspective, uh, to me, the result is sometimes not moot, but but it, you know, I'm I'm sitting watching, interested in how teams are setting up to counter each other, um, and it's it's not always for me something where I'm sitting there thinking, oh, you know, who's going to score this great goal? I, I think where attacking is interesting is is when system changes allow players to attack in a particular way that is relative to the opposition they're facing when teams change up and do something interesting whether that results in a in a tap in or a scorpion kick is kind of, of of no real relevance to me but like you said in in your question like it is subjective you know different people watch football for different reasons and i'm absolutely not going to sit here and say that one is right and one is wrong mm. except for moments of violence I, they are emphatically a good thing I mean, I I sort of joke, but at the same time, (laughs) perhaps this is not not a discussion for this podcast, because, of course, we're talking about the the history of the World Cup, maybe another time. Um, But uh, I do I do wonder about that. You know, I often I often imagine crowds, uh, vengeful crowds, uh, baying for blood. You know, we we do uh, we do remember those those acts, don't we? Well, no, I, I think actually, given that we're talking about World Cups and international football, you know, there is something that we've not addressed in any of these particularly, which is just how violent some of these games were. I mean, there have mm. been references to it um, in earlier ones, and you know, I was I was watching today the um, the final from 1994, which is going to be in in the next video that's released. Um, and within about two minutes, um, uh, Marzinho, who's who's one of Brazil's attacking midfielders, does a two-footed, both off the ground, lunging tackle uh, at Nicola Berti, which absolutely floors him, mm. and would have been a straight red card. Now, you know, no mm. even, no questions at all. And in commentary, they're going, "Oh, I mean, you know, I think the Italians have convinced the referee to book him there." And it it is interesting to see how. Well, how did how you violent... feel about it? Did did your bum lift off to your seat slightly when you saw it? I mean, how did it make you feel? Well, my instinctive reaction was that was a horrific challenge. But then when you look at it, you know his his feet go either side of the ball. Bertie's leg is behind the ball, and he doesn't make much contact with him. So I think it looks a lot worse than it is. But mm. but at the same time, I think we have become accustomed. To, I think if we watched games from the 1950s and 1960s, you know, it's one of the things that people talk about with with players like um, Pele, the just the amount of physical abuse that he had to take in his role as a talented player. You know, he got kicked all over the place. Nobby Styles did it to Eusebio when when England cancelled out Portugal in the semi final in '66. I mean, these these were tough guys playing within the latitude of of rules that didn't didn't view fouls the same way that they're viewed now um and i think it is surprising to to kind of go back and look at those games and see how violent football used to be yeah well from brutish uh, squarey football let's uh, let's move to the opposite end of the spectrum and talk about the magic square alex which we cite in the video uh, 82 to 90 brazil's midfield formation at the 82 world cup what I find interesting about this team is that Socrates, uh, Socrates and Zico, the two attacking midfielders at the top end of the Magic Square, they're, I mean, to my mind, they're definitely better known than Serginho and Ever, the, the strikers ahead of them. And that, that got me thinking that with the exception maybe of Ronaldo, um, it's interesting that Brazil are better known throughout the history for their attacking midfielders like Pelé and Ronaldinho and you know, arguably now Neymar, you know, which plays on the wing as well. Um, better known for those sorts of players than they are for their traditional number nines. And I wondered if you thought, if that's slightly different from the general idea that primary goal scorers or those traditional number nines are always best remembered. Maybe I've invented that. 
No, I, I think it's an interesting point because there's definitely a, a vein in Brazilian football of um, the the primacy of individual talent, uh, of tricks. And that's why, you know, if you go back through players like Rivaldo to Rivellino to um, Garincha, you know, it's feints and it's tricks and it's dribbling that are the things that really rouse and excite. And that that some, particularly because, you know, Brazil has, has had this rich tradition of of either really tricky wingers or really tricky attacking midfielders, that, that the number nines are kind of there to finish that off. And that the moments that are memorable are the moments that lead up to the goal. Um, Pele's an interesting case because Pele was a centre forward, but he was a centre forward that the Brazilians would refer to as a Ponte de Lanza, which is, you know, a centre forward who drops off a lot. Tostao did a similar kind of thing. And, and so in terms of our understanding of, of, of an out and out centre forward, you know, it, 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 they're not, you know, your classic German number nine or Italian number nine, a sort of a Paolo Rossi or a Pippo Inzaghi or a Gert Muller. Um, there is that creativity. I mean, I, again, watching the 1994 videos to, to do the script for the next one um, without talking about it too much and jumping ahead, they had Romario and Bebeto up front in, in 94. And those, I think Romario is that kind of striker. I think he is up there with with Ronaldo. Um, but again, Bebeto, who was very much seen as a partner with him, was like Eder, was like Pele, who was, you know, the, the kind of player who drops off, who finds space, who creates, but also can finish. But I think it's those moments of skill, and it may be that it's a striker who can do it, like Ronaldo, or it may be that it's, that it's an attacking midfielder. Serginho is a really interesting point, because Serginho was almost a really atypical Brazilian footballer. You know, he was kind of lumpen and physical and you know, there's sort of a, a question as to why he maybe wasn't playing at centre-back. And and what was interesting about his use in that 82 team was that it was to create space for the others, that it was to, to tie up defenders and push his way around and get on the end of, of crosses to try and knock stuff down. Um and he is kind of forgotten in that way. And it would be interesting to to reprise looking at him in, in terms of, you know, maybe comparing him to someone like Diego Costa and say, you know, what, what was it that he brought to that team that, that is so easy to forget by comparison? But but would it have been, you know, would they have been able to work that square without somebody who was aggressive and physical and competitive up front? And I, I don't know the answer to that, but I'd need to watch more games. But it, I think it's a really interesting question. Talking of players writing themselves into our uh, collective memory, the Italian team uh, had one player who I think lots of people might be familiar with in Marco Tardelli, and you know potentially Paolo Rossi is perhaps remembered beyond Italy as well. But interestingly, that winning team it wasn't full of again of players you know often spoken about today and i wondered if that's just you know another indication that defense really was king in you know in the 1980s and that perhaps this is why you know we might find it more difficult to recall certain names like that you know now 30, 35 years later i think i think there's certainly something in that i think also that um when when football became a very televisual sport then it was it was attacking moments that kind of stood out in that way and that commentators latched onto. Um, I think it's also very easy when you look at, at 1982 to remember those Brazilian players because of the types of goals that were scored. I mean, some some of those goals were absolutely extraordinary. And, and it's, I guess, you know, a kind of collective folk memory of football has probably only got so much space to to have room in it for you know, memories from a tournament that happened such a long time ago. And it's it's quite natural that really spectacular goals would be what lodges in there. Um, and I, I guess as well, you know, a lot of people who are coming to football subsequent to that, I was born in 1982, so I've got no idea what the tournament was like, except through, you know, recovered footage. Um, that naturally privileges 
you know, sort of the top 10 goals that were scored rather than the top 10 tackles. So so the way that we process historical football um, it naturally, I think, focuses on on what's exciting and, and what's dynamic and, and defence, you know, strong systems, good tracking back. <laughs> yeah, it's not it's not really what, what makes a YouTube highlight video. That's that's true. And I think that, that reminds me of the conversation I heard on UMAX if we used to have um, a podcast about a year ago and uh, it, it took a slightly different format to this one. It was before we were making whiteboard football videos. But there was a uh, particular podcast I recall now, um, in, which was attended by, I forget his full name, but he's Nick from Sporting Intelligence. And for those of you listeners who don't know what Sporting Intelligence are, it's a, a website or a blog that's um, very well respected within the football writing community for covering a lot of the financial and statistical sort of factual side of, of football. Um, and that particular podcast was about the future direction of football broadcasting and about whether there was potential for uh, the Premier League to set up its own streaming service. One of the points that Nick made um, about why that perhaps wasn't, you know, something that was going to happen, and they used the comparison to to the NBA and about how, you know, nowadays the NBA's own own uh, Twitter account will actually tweet out little videos of, of some of the hoops Um and Nick made the the salient point that uh, football is a game populated by often, you know, three, maybe four goals if we're if we're lucky, and that those goals, in terms of, uh, I suppose you could you could calculate it by the how much money the game is costing broadcasters overall. You could split that up. Uh, so if if a game is going to cost Sky two hundred thousand pounds a show, and there's there's three goals, they're each worth sixty six thousand pounds. You know, whereas in basketball, there's uh, so many uh, two points scored that the goals are of you know significantly less value as a result of that. So it's, it's quite interesting then that that might affect our collective memory of how football has developed over the years. Um, and the other thing I would say is it's it's easy for us now to sit here and look back and go, OK, well, that, that Italian team in 1982 who won, don't really remember much about them, don't remember many of their players. But if we look at the Euros that's just gone by, um, I can't remember many of the names of the Portugal team aside from Ronaldo <laughs> that, that won and I think you know I'm not thinking about that tournament in quite the same way but it is important for us throughout this campaign uh, that we're that we're taking on over the summer to look at the history of the World Cup to remember mm. that uh, we are looking at tactics we're looking at how football can be played better and worse but the very important uh, outlier to remember in all of this is the football uh, anything anything can happen and, and frequently does um, and sometimes there's you know, less, uh, less, uh, I suppose, access to the, the, the rhyme and reason for that. So as this Italian team won in 1982, so so too did Portugal win in 2016. I have no idea how. Yeah, and it's, I think that's a, a fair point. Um, and it's certainly been very, very interesting for me to go back and, and watch games from way before, you know, I was I was interested in football and old enough to be allowed to stay up to watch it on match of the day and and all that and you know you kind of for a start you're conditioned by what's available and while there are some web resources that carry quite a lot of of games generally speaking you're talking about from the 70s mid 70s onwards and it's quite hard to track down full matches of teams so you could look at you could look at the 82 final and say okay well i can watch the final i can i can watch that from start to finish via youtube that's fine but then to contextualize that and to work out whether you know was that a freak result um what were the teams like in the run-up to it can i watch the group games it suddenly becomes a lot harder and uh, you know i think we can we have a familiarity now with international football because uh, because of the Champions League and because there are so many global stars in the in the Premier League as well. Plus, there's the availability of La Liga and Liga and the Bundesliga on on satellite television. That when you go to a tournament, go, go to come to watch a tournament like a Euros or a World Cup now, it's much rarer to to find players that you've absolutely not heard of at all. Whereas if you look back at, at squads from even from the kind of 1990s. If you weren't watching football regularly then, you know, there just there wasn't the same sort of familiarity. Players were much more diffusely spread. 
Um, they were, you know, a lot of players would, would stay in their domestic leagues. Those domestic leagues would not be featured on television in the UK. So I think, I think UK viewers, part of the excitement of a World Cup then would have been, you know, who are these guys? Yeah, and, and if you look at the Brazilian side, uh, of 82 you know many of them played in brazil well i can't imagine there's any chance at all that back in 1982 you could have watched brazilian football in the uk so these were truly uh exotic footballers that were suddenly thrust onto a world stage um and you know i think if we're looking at the italian team particularly it's interesting because obviously football italia which was such a boost to the love and knowledge of Italian football in the UK in the in the nineties, um, that only started then. So again, you know, these are these are players that applying their trade in Serie A almost exclusively weren't coming over to England to play in what was then the first division. Um, you know, it's it it may be that that the familiarity just wasn't there in the first instance, and they've kind of almost immediately faded out of view, having not really been known beforehand. Well, uh, to someone who definitely is known and remembered, we obviously can't record this without talking about Diego Maradona. Um, now, in the video, you talk about how Carlos Bellardo was tasked with creating a system that could get the most out of Maradona um, in a workmanlike striker ahead of him, and as you say, seven willing runners behind. Uh, Bellardo seemed to manage that. Did the team make Maradona look good, or did he make the team look good, or is it all too complicated uh, to take these positions, Alex? I think I think both are true. Um, I think Maradona. Of course you do. <laughs> because I'm awkward like that. No, because I think it's actually the fairest answer. Um, I, I, you know, Maradona is without doubt one of the the top five players ever in world football. Um, right. So there's no doubt because I have read things about Maradona that suggest that he was, uh, you know, absolutely fantastic dribbler and uh, and uh, shooter but that his passing range wasn't brilliant. Uh, he did very little defensive work when sometimes he needed to. Like There, there, are, there are questions, uh, but I mean, I don't know what you think about that. Isolating a player from a team is a nigh on impossible task because if you, had, if you had a team of, you know, five Maradonas playing with five Juan Raquelmes and then a goalkeeper, like that team would probably not win much. Against. So let, let me ask you this then, and, and simply because I'm being difficult, Alex. Um, if isolating a player from a team is nigh and impossible, then how can we have the best players of all time? How can Maradona be one of the five best of all time? Because best, when you talk about it, is, I guess, an amalgamation of records, usually goal-scoring records, which is which is why these kind of best things always privilege that. Um it's about achievements. Uh, it's about what those players have done for their teams. So you kind of look at someone like Maradona, and, and actually part of his greatness is that he elevated that team above probably the sum of its parts by being so good. Now, was would he have been able to do that if Bilardo hadn't set the system out that way? No, probably not. Similarly, if Bilardo hadn't had Maradona, he could well have played a different way and, and Argentina might still have won. It just would have been different. It's, it, it is incredibly difficult to say, but I think there are always going to be players that stand out above the crowd through a combination of what they achieve, what they allow their teammates to achieve and their individual skills. And I would say Pelé, Maradona, for me, the greatest of all, Cruyff, um, and then, you know, I think you can probably put Messi and Ronaldo in that as a sort of five together. And even then you're leaving out people like Zinedine Zidane or you're leaving out people like Ferent Pushkas if you go all the way back or, you know, it it is an impossible question. And and it, it ref, I guess it refers back to that thing that we were talking about earlier in, you know, in terms of memory and the availability of, of football that... that the, the the impact and power of, of, of a Lionel Messi or a Cristiano Ronaldo is significantly greater in in kind of terms of, of consumption and media and attention and focus than a player like Matthias Zindela, who we've talked about before, or Nande Higuti. But maybe those players actually affected the way that football was played tactically much more. 
You know, the, yeah. The, yeah. you know, the, there can be players who've had a huge impact in the evolution of the game, but because no one who's alive now saw them play, then they'll never be talked of in the same breath as as someone like Messi or Ronaldo. And and that's you know that's a whole other point. That that is why to me Johan Cruyff is the greatest of all time. It's not just because of what he did as a footballer, which was wonderful and extraordinary, but it was what he did as a manager and also what he did for players off the pitch in terms of, you know, rights and in terms of commercial opportunities and contracts and all that kind of stuff. You know, he he did everything. Um but yeah, I mean, it's an impossible question to throw at me. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, there's another angle to take on it as well. And I think you, you, you touched on it there when you talked about how, um, you know, there's an immediacy about football now and that it's possible to watch almost every waking moment of the best footballers in, in or every working moment, I should say, of the best footballers in the world. Uh, Wayne Rooney strikes me as a good example of this um, and the negative side of that as well, because obviously we talk about how the impact of Ronaldo and Messi might be felt much you know much more strongly than a player like Matthias Sindelar back in the 50s um but also the negatives of what they do and Wayne Rooney is a, is a is a good example of this and he's also someone who I think would serve as a good example of how memory affects um our view of football players as well because I'm utterly convinced that in 10 and 20 years time Wayne Rooney will be retrospectively remembered as you know this uh, this wonderful English football player who fought, you know played with tenacity and, and aggression and scored some incredible goals. At the moment, uh, when he's sort of dwindling away at the end, you know the bottom of, of his career, and I think there are lots of you know Manchester United and England fans who'd may perhaps rather not see him in the team. Uh, our collective vision or perspective of this player is you know slightly dampened by that. But when it's enhanced by nostalgia into you know one or two decades time, I think that drastically changes the way that we we view footballers retrospectively so you're absolutely right I mean it's impossible question to answer it's impossible to uh, compare compare football players from the past to football players from the present not only for the reasons of tactical differences but also for the reasons of the impact of things like uh, like that immediacy of football and like nostalgia Um, so let's move on to a question that might be more answerable for you (laughs) Alex Uh, I read an interesting piece uh, in the Guardian website earlier in which Jonathan Wilson says uh, that England are venerated too much for their performance in Italia 90. Um, He argues that had Lineker been been denied one of those penalties against Cameroon, they would have gone out in the quarterfinals like so many other tournaments and it it wouldn't have been such a big deal. What's your opinion on England's performance in the tournament? Uh, Do you think Wilson is, is correct? And why do people remember it so fondly? I think Wilson is correct. Um, I think that England had quite a lot of creativity in that team, but were playing in the same sort of um, system that that most of the teams were using there with with a sweeper. Um, uh, I think it was Mark Wright, and then he had Des Walker and Terry Butcher either side, and then um, fullbacks that could push forward but didn't enormously. Um, I I think. I think Italia 90 actually almost ties in to what we were just talking about in the impossible question. It's um, it's the moment that English football kind of moved away, I think, from being uh, a, a... I don't want to say working class game, but that is part of it, certainly. Um, but the associations with hooliganism, uh, all of that negative stuff from the 70s and 80s, um, a kind of dour style, long ball, very direct, you know, think of the the continuation from Charles Reap through to uh, Graham Taylor at Watford and then England later on. Um, Italia 90 was where it all kind of turned. And, you know, within that period, you, you, you had people like Gaza, you had fever pitch coming out not that long afterwards you you had the kind of the beginnings of the commodification of football um sky you know took over the the rights and launched the premier league two years later and i think it's very easy retrospectively to see this team of names that we recognize people like lineker people like gaza and david platt and the semi-final exit and the tears and everything that came after that when footballers started to become 
kind of media personalities that would have profiles in Loaded magazine and so on. Um, that that it's it's easy to forget that maybe the football actually wasn't that great, um, and and that it's for me that's very much the turning point between kind of that older era of things not being as available and the period at which you know suddenly football is there front and center and it to me isn't surprising that that we attach a lot of nostalgia to that and i think gaza is a really interesting kind of locus for that conversation because i think gaza embodies the the trouble of that transition i think he was actually quite an old fashioned footballer in terms of his focus was playing the game and he loved it he was obsessed by it but as the game changed he suddenly was thrust into this through his skill and his ability no doubt but also his personality he was he was thrust into this role of being the kind of media schedule for what football was uh while actually he just wanted to kind of you know kick around in the park um not not to simplify too much but i do think there's something in that idea and that that, that was part of the trouble for him um and you know that all of what we look at in terms of talking about italia 90 is is kind of refracted through that nostalgia for oh this was the turning this was when football became cool and became accessible and became something that you could read about in granta or the economist and you could talk about with your friends you know in a in a Knightsbridge wine bar as much as you could in a pub in Wapping. It's like, and and I think, I think there's a certain amount of bollocks to that argument as well. And I think it suits people like Nick Hornby to make that argument because he published a book around then, but there's no doubt that football changed. Um, and that sky had a lot to do with that. And, and it kind of suits the narrative to say that, that England were on the cusp of something incredible and were only just denied it. Whereas in actual fact, you know, they, they weren't that good. Stephen, you write, Scorsese made Mean Streets, Taxi Driver, Raging Bull and Goodfellas, but he won his Oscar for The Departed. Sometimes the best doesn't get the glory. Now, you were referring to the Denmark team, of 1992 and for those of us who don't remember the details uh will you remind us of of that team and their achievement yeah they've kind of gone down in folklore as the cool glorious losers of of, you know international football uh perhaps unfairly because you know they overachieved considering that they have a population of five million which is the same as scotland uh and it was just a wonderful set of circumstances that brought about this extraordinary pool of talent from such a small nation. Uh, and furthermore to that, it was the nature of their football that they played. Um, it was just a collective of very laid-back individuals who enjoyed life off a pitch as, more, as much as they enjoyed entertaining on it. Um, and just kind of forged together by this disciplinarian German coach. Uh, and then it all came together wonderfully in 1986. Uh, which is special to me because that's the first World Cup I, I truly remember. And I'm sure that's the same for everyone, that first World Cup will always hold a special place in your heart. Um, and to see the Danish side in the coolest kit ever created, just playing this extraordinary football, um, was was a joy to behold for a kid. And so that, that was in Mexico in 86, was it? Sorry, yeah, it was Mexico 86, which was, you know, was just sun sunlit and extremely foreign looking <laughs> you know when you see the kind of shadows of what looked like a spider on the pitch and it looks so hazy and uh, and of course there's some very very famous moments from that world cup but for me it was all about in the quali- well the, the group stage where denmark were just sublime um they won all three games they, they thrashed uruguay in a famous 6-1 um drubbing uh with LKR scoring a hat-trick and you know, Laudrop just running riot, just looking on another planet. Uh, and it all fell apart horribly once they encountered uh, Spain in the last 16. But for that kind of week, it just opened up my eyes. It was like, who are these teams? Who, who are these players? Um, and then, you know, consequently, as you grow up, you, you read about them, you learn about them. 
and it's an extraordinary tale but back then it was all about just being a kid and just having my eyes wide open to this fantastic team playing a, a, a kind of football which is very modern now but you know this was look 30 years ago um possession based uh, a lot of trust placed into the creative individuals to kind of carve something out kind of individually um open at the back so you know back at a, a charge that can be leveled at certain premier league clubs such as man city from last season uh, and just entertaining um and and just you could say naive as well i mean that was certainly the case after progressing to the, the final 16 spain basically just sat back counter-attacked and picked them off mercilessly um but Denmark just kept on pouring forward. They were that type of team as well. They could be two up, ten minutes to go, and they would just flood forward looking for that third goal, uh, which made them all the more entertaining. In the article, uh, you write about the differences between that mid-80s team and then the well, you know, the, the, the more academically successful team of, of 1992. Um, what was it about the 1992 team that was le- less interesting, despite the fact that they won the European Championship? predominantly the coach and perhaps just lessons learned as well um you know maybe there was kind of a, a post-mortem uh and, and where they considered themselves to be too naive and too open um and so the, the new coach that came in was very much a, a pragmatist um and also of course with great players you know um Olsen's and kind of Ericsson's and Mulvey's and Libby's they started to age and they started to retire six years later and they were raced by you know, lesser talent, shall we say, John Jensen's. Um, and so, you know, the coach could only play with what he had. And, and so they formed a kind of team very similar to kind of, um, oh, well, I was going to damn them then and say the kind of Greece side of, of who also won the Euros against the odds. But they were far more entertaining than that purely because they've got Brian Loudrop in the team. Uh, Michael's younger brother, who's just one of my all-time favourite players. But, Largely, it was done through practicality. It would just be kind of, you know, and the manner of winning 92, that was, you know, extraordinary. No question about it. But the manner of it was to kind of suck up pressure, hit and break, take your chances, you know, maximise set pieces and, and all the rest of it. So it was a very different type of football. The achievement was also very different indeed. It was, you know, it has to go down as one of the greatest underdog tales of all time. So on this podcast uh, I spent some time talking to Alex Stewart about how goals per game in the major tournaments dipped uh, after the 1960s and never really recovered the rates of the the free scoring 50s. Italia 90, which is just two years before uh, Denmark's victory in 92 um, recorded the lowest goals per game rate to that point at just 2.21. So it was clearly a time uh, in which you know defence had primacy over attack at least tactically speaking and system was was definitely king. Does that reflect your Danish team in 92? It absolutely does in 92, yeah. It was a very different football. I mean, it was a sea change, wasn't it, kind of um, post-1990. Um, and you go back to 86, and you look at... It wasn't just the Denmark team. There was the Soviet Union team, you know, just extraordinary attacking talent. Um, and you look at the group stages, Soviet Union beat Hungary 6-0. Um, you know, we've already talked about the six-one for um, for Denmark against Uruguay. You wouldn't see these these kind of results again, you know. And it's not just the fact that these one team was thrashing the other; it was the fact that you know, once victory was secured, it from 1990 onwards, the points were all that mattered. They shut up shop. There was a certain kind of openness that preceded that. It was a certain kind of let's entertain, let's show what we can do, let's exhibit ourselves, and that's unfortunately, I think, was lost. To the importance of system and you know just basically getting over the line why and why is that do you think because we see that so often nowadays and it's it's a it's a frequent topic of conversation um often you know when people are talking about the premier league you might mention someone like jose Mourinho or even you know tony, tony pulis might be the extreme example of this um but you know i guess is it is it is it simply about about money is it is it about the risk of of losing well, when you asked the question then, halfway through the question, the first thing that came to mind was money. Uh, it has to be at the forefront. It has to be kind of, you know, one of the main contributing reasons because, uh, and not just money, of course, everything was tied in with that, the importance of it. I mean, looking at Pulis, the importance of staying in the Premier League, 
you know, the money that they lose if they, if they go out of the Premier League, it's, and the money, of course, that they amass being in there. So teams now, they can't afford to take chances. Uh, I know that sounds simplistic, but it really does come down to that. It's, you look, go back again to the Denmark team of 86, and again to that defeat to Spain in the last 16. Now, there is naivety there. There is kind of just this open willingness to, to show off. And it cost them dear. And then you look at 1992, and it was a much different outlook, a different mentality. Now, that can be spread throughout all of football. Um, it wasn't just the Danish team in 86 what had that mentality. There were many international teams, there were many club teams who just played open football and you know, realised that it's an entertainment business first and foremost. That changed. I mean, it's arguable as to actually pinpoint a, a, a date and time as to when that changed. But certainly in that era, there was a sea change. And it only got, that well, depends on, on how you look at it, but for me, I would say it's only got worse ever since. Um, and now, you, you know, you, the management are staffed by the Pulises and, you know, the Mourinho's and 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 you read these transfer kind of rumours for this summer and and any player linked to Manchester United. It, it, it used to be where it'd be, this is a Manchester United type of player. Now it's, he's at a Mourinho type of player. And, and that's the difference. And of course, tied in with that as well is the kind of the cult of the super manager as well. Um, and, and thank goodness for people like kind of Pep Guardiola, uh, who you know seek to play this kind of um, entertaining football. Because I, I think in in the kind of jet stream of these super managers are many other kind of inferior managers who basically learn from them and copy their methods. And I, you know, I'm not knocking Mourinho here, but he's just a, a very good example, I think, of what we're referring to. These managers who just look to grind out results and kind of you know system is king. And to, to entertainment's detriment, I think. Yeah, I, I, it's very interesting that you talk about the sea change as well, because Alex mentioned earlier on this podcast that Italia 90 for him is potentially, you know, the the the, uh, the point of that sea change. And he talked about the Premier League formation just two years afterwards. He talked about the sort of collective sense of um, of observation from certainly England fans in Italia 90, and that the commodification of football was, you know, beginning there. Um, and I think you can probably trace a lot of these changes um, back to back to that tournament, maybe. Yeah, it, it, it was a pivotal moment in, in football history, 1990, uh, particularly in, in England, of course, because of the nature of of what happened prior to it and and how football changed after. Uh, and it did become, you know, like the old cliches of kind of become more middle class and just then. Um, you know, that whole Nick Hornby fever pitch thing, which is absolutely true, though. It, it, it changed significantly. And people who, who went, go to games, you know, I used to go home and away during the 80s. I used to go home and away during the 90s. It was a different sport. It was a different experience. You were treated completely differently, largely for the better. You were treated as a human being for once. But, you know, that fed into every aspect of football. It, it did become homogenised. It did become kind of middle class. And and we've lost something very significant there. Uh, and then it, it feeds further into the actual football itself. Um, just kind of safer football. Um, you know, and I, I don't want to sound too kind of pretentious here, but maybe there is a link there that we're looking at kind of, you know, a safer football off a pitch leading to safer football on it. Well, on that depressing note, I'm going to have to end. <laughs> but uh, thanks very much for your time, Stephen, and we'll talk to you again soon. Pleasure.